My name is Judy Carver and William Golding was my father. In this talk, I want to provide some insights into his family life and the profound influence it had on his writing and on Lord of the Flies in particular. My father's home in Marlborough, number 29 The Green, was on a kind of fault line between the two systems of belief held by his parents. And this pair of irreconcilable beliefs, I think, coloured my father's life and comes very strongly in Lord of the Flies. This picture was drawn by my grandfather and I think it's very typical of him. It's very exact and careful. He's taken a lot of trouble with it. It's very precise. It's not sentimental, but uh, it's a sunny picture. You can see the shadows. And I think you would say, looking at that house, that it was an all right place to live. It was a place of security. This is a portrait of my grandfather as a young man. He was 22. And as a young man, I think he was perhaps rather unsure of himself and had a struggle becoming a teacher. He eventually became science master at Marlborough Grammar School. He was a very convinced socialist, scientist and a rationalist. And he believed very much that if you gave people good housing and medical care and a good education, then they would naturally become good and a good society would emerge as a result. He was also very convinced of the world of reality as described by science, or at least the science that he taught. He believed very strongly that there could not be things like ghosts. He felt that the laws of physics precluded there being ghosts. And I think in a way he's very like Piggy in that Piggy says in Lord of the Flies, if there were ghosts, then things wouldn't work the way they do. This was what my grandfather believed. He also believed in progress. He thought that things were getting better and better. And I think he really believed, at least up until the Second World War, that things were going in the right direction and a good society was going to emerge. This is a portrait of my grandmother, my grandma, Mildred. She's very much of a contrast to Alec. She wasn't at all a rationalist, and I'm not sure that she was a socialist, actually. And she believed, at least to a certain extent, in God, whereas my grandfather was a professed agnostic. She was born and brought up in Cornwall, and all her life, she was totally convinced that ghosts were a reality. She had absolutely no problem believing in their existence. She was very superstitious. I remember her shouting at me once because I, I opened an umbrella in the house, which is a bringer of terrible bad luck. And she knew an amazing number of superstitions, things you shouldn't do, like putting a shoe on a table because that would mean a, a ship would sink. And she lived all her life, I think, with an awareness that she was older. She was five years older than my grandfather. She put down her age as five, less, five years less than it was on her wedding certificate. She said she was 30. Actually, she was 35. And I think she was always slightly humiliated about her looks and I feel very sorry about that. She looks I think lovely here, this is her wedding day, her wedding dress and it's a lovely dress. I never saw her wear anything half as nice as that when I knew her and she may have worn 
nicer things as a young woman. But her home in Cornwall was a great refuge for my father. He loved going down to Cornwall. He'd actually been born in her mother's house in Newquay on the north coast of Cornwall. And the Cornish beaches that he saw in Newquay and played on as a child were, for him, the epitome of, well, of all happiness, I think, really. This is a photograph of number 29, the green, and I'm showing it because I think it reflects far more my father's experience of the house and probably his mother's too. He said about her that she, like him, lived mostly in her head, that she lived a life of fantasy, of imaginings, of stories. She was an absolutely brilliant teller of ghost stories, terrifying ghost stories, with a highly developed sense of evil as well as spookiness. And of course, Cornish ghost stories are, are quite famous. It was probably a, a local tradition, but she certainly brought it to great, uh, to great fruition. And I think she passed on her skills as a storyteller to my father, who remembered her ghost stories all his life with uh, terror, but admiration as well. Every summer, the Golding family decamped from Marlborough and went down on the train, as you still could in those days, all the way from Marlborough to Newquay to stay in my great-grandmother's boarding house on Mount Wise. This was where my father had been born in 1911. And I think in this photograph, he's probably about two, looking perhaps slightly surly, but basically enjoying himself. And beaches for him, Cornish beaches in particular, stayed all his life as the picture of the perfect place for a small boy. Sand and sea, the perfect toys. This picture is as near as I can get to the view that they must have had from the house on Mount Wise before the town got much more built up and there were buildings in the way. It's a, an enchanting view and one my father treasured. However, it's also true that Beaches in Cornwall held for him darker memories. He was three when the First World War broke out. And my Uncle Joe's passed on to him something that he, Joe, had seen down on the beach. I think probably in 1915, when Joe would have been nine and my father was about four. Joe went down to the beach and saw... He says, a number of boats with bits of men in them. And I can really imagine this nine-year-old telling his younger brother in horrified and hushed whispers about this. Although my father didn't see this, the picture in his mind stayed with him all his life and I think allowed him to combine the darker images from the war with the idyllic happiness of life on the beach. And this, of course, comes in Lord of the Flies. Ralph and Piggy are thrilled when they first emerge onto the beach, not only lots of sand and sea, but no adults. But it's on that same beach that the terrible dance erupts later in the novel. At the end of the summer, the Golding family had to go back to Marlborough and leave behind the Cornish beaches and the sunshine. And I think most people can identify with sadness at the end of the holidays. It's interesting to note that there is no winter in Lord of the Flies. My father evidently envisaged the setting 
as being quite near the equator because although the action lasts several months, there's no appreciable change of seasons. But for my father, the return to Marlborough meant also that he could no longer avoid the conflict between his father's rational view and his mother's acceptance of the supernatural. And the approach of darkness during his childhood, he writes about this, would at a certain point in the afternoon begin to spoil the day for him as he realised the night with its terrors was approaching. The house in Marlborough backed onto the graveyard of St Mary's Church and for my father this was an additional source of horror. He was very frightened of the cellar in the house but he's, he was also very frightened of the next door graveyard and his intuitions about the garden in a way were quite correct. It was in fact taken out, it was a section carved out of the old burying ground and my grandfather told Jose that when he was first digging in the garden when they moved there in about 1912 something like that he found human bones. So my father's sense of horror about the graveyard and about the house in general during the night brought him a sense of inescapable fear that Alex's rational view could not compete against. And this, of course, comes in Lord of the Flies. You might remember the discussion they have on the beach about the existence of ghosts. When Piggy says, I don't believe in no ghosts, and Ralph realises with a sinking feeling that they, they should have left that conversation to daylight. There's no place in Alex or Piggy's universe for ghosts or for inexplicable evil. But for Jack, for example, the possibility of a beast is something he can manipulate. He's a very skilled demagogue. He can make this work for him and, in effect, give him more power. The struggle on the island isn't simplistically between good and evil or even law and anarchy, though my father at one stage said the book was about the rule of law and its importance. It's also about the existence of these two worlds, a world where everything can be explained by science, as thought by Alec, and a world of unseen dangers where you never quite know what is going to happen, especially in the dark. As my father grew older as a teenager and young man, he of course had to face the need to move away from home. And I think for him, this was coupled with a need to move away from the security of his father's ideas and perhaps to try to encompass some state of mind where he could allow his mother's very frightening ideas to have a place as well. And that development I shall talk about in the next section. My thanks are due to the people and institutions listed here, especially to Nicola Presley. This is the address of our website, which contains quite a lot of information about my father and about Lord of the Flies, but also about his other, other novels. And there is also a specific link which gives support for students and teachers. So please do have a look. Thank you.